Section 12 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 12. Maxwell Struthers Burt, by Blanche Colton Williams. Winner of the o henry memorial short story prize nineteen twenty scribner's magazine contained in the issue for july nineteen fifteen a short story entitled the waterhole it was signed by a name hitherto unknown in fiction maxwell struthers burt the narrative at once implicitly promised to reward the reader for his outlay of time and energy promised by a beginning that definitely conveyed the shaping up of material and subtly suggested forces drawing together for action as the story progressed it pictured the shimmering arizona desert under a steel blue sky and a heat so intense the horn of the saddle burned your hand it recounted a search for hidden treasure abandoned when through two logical mishaps the water supply failed it described realistically the tortures of thirst assuaged the torture and pointed the climax at the waterhole no other than a man who knows adventure at first hand in the great west could have written the tale nor other than one whose past had been spent among books and ideas the hero of the waterhole is represented as telling his story to three classmates at the end is the twist of surprise which links the narrator with the love element delicately inwoven only by the surprise does the author disclose his apprenticeship and that may have been admissibly a concession to the fashion in fiction by every hallmark the story is the sure product of the craftsman the waterhole was the forerunner of other stories nearly all of which combine the mountains and plains of the west with the club life of the east stories of restaurants where men get together over glasses of leave it at that over glasses and the most exotic food or where ladies and gentlemen gather in a dining room around impeccable linen plate and crystal as his west identifies mr burt with adventure so the east identifies him with gentlefolk the first quality in his fiction is truth to life as he knows it life and vision through the temperamental lens of the artist of a philadelphia family mr burt was born in baltimore october eighteenth eighteen eighty two i am an ect philadelphian he says of himself bred in the bone for many generations but since the age of eighteen when i went to college i have been what i think is called an escaped philadelphian my family still live there but i don't he was educated in private schools in philadelphia very badly he thinks as most men of my generation were getting through school somewhat earlier than is usual he worked for two years as reporter on the philadelphia times under the man who had been private secretary to lincoln colonel a k mcclure at the tender age of sixteen the boy was probably the youngest philadelphia reporter in newspaper days of hard drinking and fakes my last week i had one murder two suicides and three fires if i remember correctly he says i don't think that was very good for a boy of seventeen when he was old enough he went to princeton where in nineteen o four he took his bachelor's degree later to munich for a year then to merton college oxford throughout his prose and poetry the academic shadows of princeton and oxford towers lie lightly over the brave exploits of his heroes subduing their adventures to a mellowness never approached by unmodified highlights of risk and hazard to princeton mr burt avows himself indebted even for his love of nature or appreciation of nature in certain phases in gifts he lists a number of things he has learned from his alma mater warm winds bringing elm scent love of the sun open fields and windy weather 
and love of bells across the fields at dusk he intended to take a degree at oxford but when a vacancy occurred at princeton they called him back to teach and there he remained for three years he had already won distinction in student days being very much mixed up in the triangle club for which i wrote two librettos meantime while teaching he spent his summers in the west gradually acquiring interests in various ranches ultimately he settled in jackson hole wyoming where he owns a partnership in ranch bar b c as the nomenclature indicates this is a cattle ranch another the partners devote to dude ranching for the uninitiated mr burke patiently explains that a dude is a non-resident of a country the word carries with it none of the contemptuous connotation of tenderfoot a dude ranch is a sort of glorified summer hotel where people are given horses taught the ways of the west and taken on pack trips mr burt's summer home his much wandering over the west and his wide interests account for his pictures and his knowledge of the blazing heat of arizona its rattlesnakes and scorpions of the big cloud river region its groves of aspen trees delicate and ghostly silver of the pelly lakes and the river francis its black rocks upjutting through the white spray of its falls of the southern wyoming desert its yellow and red buttes and stunted cactus all of it under a sky of piercing blueness out there men drive cattle in blizzards over gray expanses of sagebrush or in time of drought see them die stark mad while dust devils dance along the ridge out there too men know peace under alumerous fir tops or under myriad hosts of tall pines white under the magic of the moon the jackson hole county is the most beautiful in the united states he thinks and in this view he is supported by the testimony of the late colonel roosevelt and of owen wister mr burt's love of contrast of widely dissimilar states and kingdoms urges him to know life from opposing outlooks and to mirror their diversity in his art when tired of his ranch when desirous of gaiety he turns like the narrator of the glory of the wild green earth to the east i wanted to come back to the unexpected quiet and aloofness of a club says he to low-voiced well-scrubbed servants to a bed of cool sheets to a morning of a valet and a porcelain tub and new and beautiful clothes if he becomes nostalgic for the west he turns again to quote, the great scarred beauty of a lonely land and seeks ever to keep renewed an hundred dreams of plains that brood by wide unwearying streams of how archangels hold red sunset peaks winged with a flaming splendor desolate this love of the west is inherited as his love for the conventions is bred in the bone his great-grandfather he suspects must have been some sort of sin finer for having to leave ireland between sundown and sun up he turned fur trader in the west then there was an uncle who when he left princeton became a cattleman in arizona and california it was from this uncle that max burke learned when he was eight years of age how to throw a rope an art he never forgot between the indoor comforts of civilization and the outdoor thrills of the rancher's life mr burke experiences a joie de vivre that manifests itself minutely and concretely in his poems and his prose though he loves the mountain peaks big ones with snow and pine forests better than anything else in the world he waits not upon them but finds contentment in a lake between the hills surrounded by sedges murmurous with bees he savors the immediate sweetness of damp hay or a garden wet with showers with a keen relish as he whips the air blown cold from the snow-capped tetona in his love for nature he is a descendant of wordsworth as in his modernity he is a kinsman of rupert brooks and alfred noyes he must have delighted in the rhythm of Granchester before composing his sprightly spring in princeton which celebrates the jersey meadows golden with daffodil 
resonant with bird song and the little town of towers silvery gray and high there as the sun folds down its wings on every lawn a robin sings and kindly people take their tea under an elm or maple tree it is the same poem which captures a picturesque moment of new york i think there's nothing like at dark to see the lamps in central park turn yellow in the purple gloom to huge gold lilies dripping bloom and watch the great walls through the night ripple to towers of fabulous light other verses ring echoes of mr noyes as these from the flute player and barrel organs everywhere make songs for little children's feet and oh the chestnut trees are sweet with mr noyes he has more than a passing acquaintance as one may infer from the fact that he and the english poet are co-editors of a book of princeton verse nineteen sixteen although it is true that the greater number of his poems proclaim mr burke the celebrant of external nature even as his stories declare him yet a few of subjective mood reveal him the nature mystic interested in the soul of nature as his stories show him concerned in essential human character half concealed under the outer man after the death of a loved sister jean brooke burt an author of promise who died july fourth nineteen eighteen he published a series of sonnets entitled Reservum. in the final one the fifth he has an equivalent of shelley's he is made one with nature in the line all this i know is part of your new dream yet he is not successful in achieving the faith of the nature mystic as wordsworth was successful rain which he loves to consider objectively becomes a cold and dreary thing in his quatrain question of fantasy he has a gift like that of the earlier american joseph rodman drake a gift which enables him to write in martin of quote, a little man with cap of red and horn-brown lamp of glow-worm light unquote. this dower of fantasy again rises to imaginative heights in his story wings of the morning which suggests the return of a ghostly aviator more artificially and less happily it appears in fishing in an oscar wilde strain quote, beside the kitchen stove the cat blinked twice with eyes of gold and yawned with infinite contempt for sleep is new and old is fishing on the nile once with mysterious feline guile in moonlit temporal shadowed bays were caught bright fins in other days it is not possible to find in wilde's the sphinx a stanza of which this is reminiscent but the resemblance in subject matter and rhythm is unmistakable the title of the poem intimates another interest of the author quite in keeping with his expressed love for fly fishing and camping out the folk of mr burt's poems are treated much in the same way as those of his stories poem and story express his feeling for nature they show his opinion of people to be conditioned on intellectual appraisal mr latimer of the poems has his counterpart in sir john masters of a cup of tea in john o may each is able to buy his mood or his heart's desire and yet not quite successfully uncle jim of the poems he who came to a marvellous harmony with the hills has for his prose parallels the seekers and wanderers in closed doors le panache and a cup of tea in poems to his family there is an affectionate linking of the human being and nature one need hardly read mr bird's own words about his wife fortunately she loves the west as much as i do to be aware of this truth after reading k n b in songs and portraits and various other lines in which reference to her is evident then of course mrs burt's the branding iron and hidden creek speak for her love of the open primavera to my daughter upon reaching four ends on a picture of himself and the child walking a field to trace out the piping of pan maxwell struthers burt met catherine newlin at oxford in nineteen twelve while he was on a vacation from his ranch they were married in nineteen thirteen 
our families had known each other always mr burt remarks but apparently it was necessary for us to go to oxford to meet there is a tradition that two writers do badly to get married to each other but that certainly has not been the case with us my wife is my most useful critic and i trust i am hers we are very savage with each other but that doesn't seem to hurt our feelings mr burt's psychological interest in men and women remains his greatest asset for his narrative in closed doors the narrator says of murray that he should have been on his way to being a great painter but he wasn't hewitt explains the fault lies in the boy's character he spluttered how the devil can you paint a portrait when you can't get inside and don't want to get inside your subject's mind when you don't know what getting inside a mind is sense of beauty oh yes he's got a marvellous sense of beauty but you can't even paint a great landscape unless you have a perception of humanity in the end as in everything else you've got to know the taste of blood and smell of sweat it is the recognition of this truth joined to his love of the outer world which gives depth and beauty to the fiction of mr burt his stories are as he occasionally implies biographies a unique character gives him material for a series of chronological incidents all bearing on the man's individuality so far with one illustrious exception his chief characters are men these incidents rise to a nominal climax as notably in le Pinage and john omey to the death of the hero but leave the reader wondering questioning about him whose life has been partly bared and so irretrievably ended you would have liked to know these men you say yet you are rather sure you never would have understood them herein is another of mr burke's greatest gifts by his power to suggest by his challenge to the imagination he induces the reader to construct and to collaborate for at least a few critics le panache stands one of the best biographical stories of the decade though arguing that hugh craig might serve as the hero for a whole novel one must admit that his portrait is as complete as one need wish or as a longer work could make it he is a riddle man one seldom attempted never solved the utmost an author can do is to record him and to emphasize his ideal this ideal is that of cyrano de bergerac who hoped when he died to sweep the floor of heaven with the plumes of his hat his panache to keep such hope craig would wear a plume immaculate mr burt's story then is the life of a man or woman illuminated by a series of vivid flashes or by a single steady light poignancy he achieves by denying a character something the deprivation of which under similar circumstances would sadden him sir john masters fell short of being a gentleman as he also missed the love of the woman he had technically won knowing the magnificent villain has failed in a vital way the reader cannot but pay him the tribute of pity in spite of the contempt burnaby justly manifests john o'may like henry james man of the beast in the jungle missed the great thing though what it was or might have been for john is difficult to say perhaps the author relies too greatly upon the principle to determine your character's behavior at the crisis put yourself in his place not that the portraits are less objective but the initial presentation appears to spring from a single significant meeting or concept and to round to completion through the author's studying his own reflection sir john would hardly permit the self-portrayal set forth in a cup of tea in nineteen seventeen mr bird entered the army as a private in the aviation service the only story he published the year of the armistice wings of the morning scriveners july nineteen eighteen reprinted in john omey in its soaring quality and exalted mood achieved after serious study of apparently earth anchored anne graham might be the narrative symbol of one who had learned superbly to wing the ether after trial runs over shard and clod 
the war was not without meaning to the art of this author in other respects as may best be found by reference to shining armor harper's july nineteen nineteen and the blood red one scribner's november nineteen nineteen the indirection of these tales pursued through a means half allegorical wholly idealistic becomes a fine directness his fiction of nineteen twenty reverts to his earlier manner with a curiously provocative predominance of the culture element a dream or two harper's may nineteen twenty and bally old not scribner's august nineteen twenty employ foreign settings and more than elsewhere show him to be of the literary family of henry james edith wharton and john galsworthy his further kinship with them emerges in mood deliberation and easy dignity of sentence rhythm each in his generation scribner's july nineteen twenty swings back to an eastern city possibly new york for its setting and reveals the antagonism between successive generations for its struggle or dramatic element one may read to find the outcome of the conflict between temporal periods and race or merely to find out whether uncle henry left his money to adrian but only a jejune reader would be satisfied with the latter the outward story in its originality in its tour de force dramatization of a subjective theme and in its technical finish it is near the peak of the author's accomplishments the committee of award of the o henry memorial prize offered by the society of arts and sciences of new york city adjudged each in his generation the best story of the year it therefore receives the first prize of five hundred dollars for the best story by an american published in america in nineteen twenty mr burt's sympathies and likes occur frequently throughout this recapitulation lest he seem like a certain famous duchess to have a heart too soon made glad too easily impressed it is well to notice that he hates with exceeding definiteness a few things socialism except as a club held over other forms of government prohibition militarism land and water promoters this comes from living in the west automobiles dirty campers this includes picnickers who lead newspapers and most churches ending in ist not the individuals belonging to them but the policy of the churches i think the last is perhaps the most serious question confronting america today, and i cannot understand why more people don't see it accentuated by the war we are in for a knockdown fight between the sons of darkness and the sons of light it's an age-long struggle at present the sons of darkness materialism hatred of beauty narrowness and unwitting socialism of the most irksome kind are winning and it seems to me that the biggest job any writer can undertake is to combat them not by tracts of course not even with them very much in his mind but by his attitude and everything he does we have the loveliest country in the world we are trying to make it materially and spiritually the most unlovely End of section twelve section thirteen of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section thirteen the alleged culture of new england by richard burton if the adage be true that a man is known by the company he keeps then reading should reveal the man for books are only gifted fellow humans talking to us the reading of an individual or a locality should throw light upon those reactions to the things of the mind and the spirit which we group under the time-honored name of culture in trying to appraise this culture we must sternly eliminate what might be called professional relation to books valuable as it may be and broadening in its effect 
it is never quite like that pleasurable more instinctive contact with letters which implies free choice and joy as a goal a memory out of childhood rises up to offer me an illustration i see a lad perched on the top rung of a tall ladder in his clergyman father's library so as to get at the volumes of the uppermost shelves and immersed in no less a tome than the albignes history of the reformation but not in the text far from it in the very gruesome pictures with which that important work teemed showing the many burnings alive engaged in by a church zealous to remind her enemies of wrath to come and furnish them a foretaste of brimstone on earth a normal boy is a truculent little animal and i fear i took an unholy shuddering delight in these depictions they seemed to shed some light on a conundrum i had recently heard which would you prefer as death the guillotine or fire the answer being fire since a hot steak is better than a cold chop but there was puzzle in my young mind too how could my kind-hearted reverend father wish to acquire such literature it seemed out of character i was glad he did have such a book but how did such literature square with his profession i had not lived long enough to see that a volume on the protestant reformation as part of church history was an essential item in his study and thus the practitioner in every walk of life will have books that are tools rather than beloved companions the culture of new england is a tradition we all know that there was a day when american literature was new england literature they were practically coterminous the august names of emerson hawthorne holmes thoreau lowell whittier and longfellow stood so intensely for that section of the land that even a great artist like poe appeared a little like an alien though by accident he was born in boston and as for walt whitman when he came along later he was a barbarian in the outer darkness of long island mark twain at the whittier dinner in the hub tried to treat that elder group of worthies as if they were mere human beings and found he had made the mistake of his life they were intellectual and artistic aristocrats and dominated the whole country and boston of course was the city of the law philadelphia had had its flavors in the days of franklin and a knickerbocker aroma lingered faintly around new york for the few who had long memories but after eighteen thirty or thereabouts the centripetal and centrifugal power of the massachusetts town was beyond question i'm from boston had a sacrosanct sound then the scenes began to shift the elder group passed from the stage and as our literature was commercialized more and more the metropolis came to be a place where authors sold their wares to which it was advisable to go for personal touch with editors and publishers suggestions of the past to be sure still center in the hub when i was living there in nineteen o two to five such benign elders as colonel higginson mrs howe and j t trowbridge were yet on earth and lent dignity to the meetings of the boston authors club but they were the last leaves upon the tree speaking several years ago to the new england women's club of that city a reference made from the platform to emerson brought a response from an old lady in the seats who spoke of him as cousin waldo and it was impressive of a sudden the greater days drew near but in dramatic contrast let me testify it is my experience that general literary references are just as likely to stir vibrations on the part of auditors in dakota hamlets as they are in the smaller towns of new england if indeed i may not add factory-ridden cities like lawrence holyoke and lynn it is only the honorable minority in such towns who have what might be termed literary savoir faire the reputed crudity of the west concerning which more in a later paper is largely in the mind's eye horatio 
i do know of a woman living in minneapolis who entered the largest bookshop of the city and inquired of the proprietor if he had a book called the new testament adding in perfect good faith it's a new book isn't it but let me hasten to assure all who have a complacent attitude in the comparison of the two sections that this incident is not local but merely human it could occur anywhere but you do not hear of it often that is all the plain truth is that new england to-day whatever its ancient claims is a queer spotty sort of neighborhood in respect of culture go a few miles outside the centres and you shall find the raw the crude the dull and the unenlightened flourishing like the green bay tree and not seldom greener the wherefore is a complex question my impression is that the quiet country folk a generation ago when our population was homogeneous and pedigree provable were much more aware of books and other denotements of cultivation than is true of them to-day the lower foreign elements a public system of education that has been forced so it opines well nigh to abandon the old-time cultural ideal cheap flashy magazines the motor car and the movie all are aspects of a modern tendency away from the time when people really sat down ruminantly in front of a book and did not care at all if it took a week to read it through let us confess it even if it lay us open to the charge of being un-american undemocratic and anti-social truth is mighty and shall prevail is it not highly probable that in the old lyceum days when henry ward beecher wendell phillips and emerson went about speaking to the tiniest country villages the inhabitants were keener for the things of the spirit and did not men constitute a larger element in those audiences now culture lies in the lap of women's clubs for protection and nourishment the stray man to be seen to-day in such assemblies has a sheepish apologetic housebroken look the only relation of the tired business man to letters is through compulsion by way of his wife to please her or perforce he listens and sleeps when awake he always seems to be saying internally don't blame me it isn't my judgment it is a judgment on me up and down the land you can meet males ten years out of college who never for a moment reveal by any interest conversation or external sign of influence that they ever had an alma mater commerce is the thing business has got them and to know the best that has been thought and said in the world detached from a utilitarian end would be a silly perversion of good time and in this boeotian state new england is exactly as prominent as any other section artist folk college professors clergymen as seen by this ruling philistine type are odd indeterminate semi-respectable since mostly poor sexless sort of creatures neither fish flesh nor good red herring let us not disguise it remove the new england women who coddle it from culture and the poor dear thing would perish women are the conservators of literature as the monks were in the middle ages if anybody still harbors the delusion that books of the better sort are kept a-going by the eastern states let him consult the monthly list of books in demand published by the bookmen and realize the parts played by the south and different sections of the west honors are easy to put it mildly meanwhile let the sweet tradition that culture is still rampant in that favorite locality go right on it is great fun to watch a mood of self-sufficiency which trades on memories and has next to nothing to back them up to take yourself seriously becomes all the more a duty when there is so little to take oliver hartford is said to have defined boston as a state of gravity surrounded by the newtons observation leads me to conclude that the very best of new england is to be found in those all but innumerable suburbs of a city 
that for census purposes really belongs in the more than a million class it is there you find the homely old-style devotion to the humanities blessed be the town meeting which has kept alive these tiny burgher communities there is a concord air about many of them the trolley links them with business and bustle but their homes preserve a country tang and a right orientation and goodness me new england has her revenge anyhow it is to be found in her all pervasive influence her cultural radiation throughout the united states a legacy from bygone days if a first-class author come out of chicago now or from st louis indianapolis louisville or even san francisco the most self-dependent town of them all outside of new york look into pedigree and background and the chances are good that a new england origin can be established if new england be dethroned her children have gone forth to conquer nevertheless it is high time that the notion that she reigns supreme in matters intellectual and aesthetic be exploded with a bang so loud as to be heard even in boston the facts are against it she no longer has a corner on the amenities any more than on the amen it teaches. and by the way perhaps undue attention to the latter has something to do with a shrinkage in the former End of section thirteen section fourteen of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section fourteen the londoner by simon pure the londoner a disastrous publishing season children's books novels editions de luxe collected editions of lord marley and w e henley desmond mccarthy the secret city a prize novel new books by two poets conrad's napoleonic novel his wife's cookery book his own thoughts on life and letters a life of hugh lane the wonderful visit young actresses and a hint to would-be dramatists london january first nineteen twenty one i understand that in america publishing has been very difficult in the year just past and that with leaping expenses and diminished returns the year has been one to which most american publishers will look back with something of a shudder the same may be said of the english publishing season just closed from every hand i hear of disappointments and small sales and turnover placed in contrast with prices for labor and production which have never been dreamed of until now whether it was that there was a false optimism or whether the return from the war of so many men led to the writing and publishing of books which otherwise would have remained hidden from the public eye i cannot say but it appears that an enormous number of new works were projected and these have in an almost equally enormous number proved to be commercial failures i should say that on the whole sales for individual books were all markedly reduced and that while there have been so many books their total sales have been extraordinarily small and unremunerative this applies to the business of book selling as well as that of publishing the london trade has been poor on the other hand i am told that in the north particularly in scotland the bookshops have been thronged certain books have enjoyed large sales but very few i have already in an earlier causery mentioned which these were but whole classes of books which had been looked to with certainty as good investments in the conditions resulting from the war have been failures i would instance particularly children's books it was thought that as these had not been published in great numbers during the war there would be an enormous demand for them now not so i should be surprised to hear of one children's book which had been a real success what happened i believe 
was that for the first time since the outbreak of war continental toys were available parents and others looking about for presents for the children sought these toys found them dear but more imposing and more new than books and bought them in large numbers the new children's books waited in the booksellers shops and none came to buy a single house lost many hundreds of pounds in this way novels also were rather a drug in the market yet the curious thing is that they also were published in great quantities why nobody knows we were all told that the rise in the price of materials would eliminate the bad novels which had been published speculatively before the war we were warned that authors who did not sell two thousand copies would in future be unable to get their novels published i should be astounded to hear that the average sale of the majority of the novels published this last year approached that number i should say that on most of the new novels by unknown or almost unknown writers issued in nineteen twenty there had been a loss for one thing publishing prices were necessarily high because of the fierce increases in wages in the printing and binding trades and this made private purchases fewer than normal for another the number of novels as to the quality of which there has been any stir in the world is almost exactly none at all on the other hand there was a noticeable boom in editions de luxe these were in demand why unless for the reason that the new rich were donating books on a large scale to themselves and to their friends nobody can tell me the fact is there to speak for itself large prices were obtained for these editions and the demand was in some cases greater than the supply this strange condition of affairs is likely to continue i hear that the new conrad was largely oversubscribed and it is already at a premium and there are to be many more such editions in the near future i observe with great interest two which are announced by macmillan the first of these is a collection of the works of lord morley i do not feel qualified to speak of the work of lord morley and i sometimes suspect that if i were to read it i should find that work a little on the dull side such at any rate is my memory of the life of gladstone which was certainly a labor of piety and therefore overweighted with gravity but there was all the same a noticeable sweetness of temper and taste in this monumental biography and in all the writing of lord morley's that i have read this quality is perceptible dignity is all very well and it cannot be missed in lord morley's work because dignity and integrity are essentially among his traits as a writer however i recall with relish a sentence from the book on voltaire a phrase which it has always been impressive to quote or adapt in conversation he said if i remember the phrase aright i have not seen the book for twenty years voltaire's writing was never the dreary stillbirth of a mind of hearsays with the negative omitted that makes a very crushing condemnation of any writer of whom one happens to disapprove even though he happened to be only a writer of causeries the second venture to which i referred above is the complete edition of the writings of w e henley no doubt this has come about through the devotion of charles wibley who i believe is one of macmillan's advisers and who was at one time a member of that group known as henley's young men mr wibley has never been celebrated as a particularly amiable critic and his vigorous musings without method in blackwood's magazine have been known to anger others besides the subjects of their attack but it is not perhaps recognized that the method still used by mr wibley is essentially that which henley introduced and into the use of which all his young men were so sedulously trained that one cannot escape the feeling that henley really wrote everything in the papers he edited i should myself say that he uses a bludgeon which is a stereotyped phrase meaning that he savages anything and anybody he does not like this is all in the best henley tradition the young men were all armed to the teeth they were all on the warpath they all coveted scalps they were out to tell people what a young man once described to me as 
the god's truth about themselves it is stimulating reading but not pleasant if one is the subject or if the subject is a friend or a relation henley's criticism is highly colored stuff and it is liable to reproduce the vagaries of all temperamental critics who must find excellences here because they are convinced that these are the only true excellences there are and who must find faults there because such things are sins against the critic's personal canons but in his own line and at his best henley was a good and robust and healthy critic he was sentimental in his poetry and his criticism alike because it was a part of that whole school's impulse to be sentimental and romantic and blustering and imperialist and noisy and noisy people are almost always sentimentalists at the same time there was life in his work and it is life after all that gives work its importance life and originality so the edition of henley is one that most book lovers will welcome it is due not only in time but in justice i observe in an american newspaper the advertisement of desmond mccarthy's remnants so american readers will be enabled to read the work of a very able journalist i must have mentioned him at the time when mccarthy took over the literary editorship of the new statesman in succession to squire he has long been known as a dramatic critic and wrote a book of criticism about the famous vedren barker management at the court theatre london his most recent accounts of ireland in the manchester guardian have been first-rate he is an excellent journalist and remnants enshrines a selection from his various contributions to the new statesman and other papers mccarthy is an exceptionally popular man in london he is a conversationalist whose mots are repeated and his range of friendships is unusually wide unusually genuine also i can remember a man for whose lunch it had been suggested that i should pay complaining bitterly nobody ever thinks of doing anything for me or paying for my lunch people are always eager to do things for desmond i fancy his explanation was not that mccarthy was a more fascinating person than himself but that mccarthy had been to cambridge whereas he was an oxford man i will not begin a controversy as to the after effects of going to one or other of these universities but ingenious readers can discuss among themselves the singular clannishness of cambridge men in a letter which i received the other day the whole question of prizes for literary work was raised afresh i learned that a prize as to the establishment of which i had never heard a syllable had been given to hugh walpole for the best novel of nineteen nineteen the secret city i do not know if the award was publicly made as is the case with the hawthornden prize but i rather think not it is the tate black prize whether it is solely for novels or whether like the hawthornden it is for the best work of the imagination issued within a given period i cannot say but it is interesting that it should have been given to walpole because while other men might have been more in need of the money than he it is a good thing that committees should not be afraid to award a prize to so successful a writer humanitarianism is such a constant element in such affairs it would be so if i were on any committee of the kind that the well-known writer is generally ruled out at the beginning in some ways this is commendable since is given unknown men a chance but it has its disadvantages principally because it makes the gift appear a charity secondarily because if the prize is given to those who are more poor than meritorious the gift loses its distinguishing value and thereby its cachet now that the tate black prize has started so well it will carry with its future gift an invaluable association talking about works of imagination i have recently heard ecstatic accounts of two such works which are to set the world into a fever one is a fantastic story by walter de la mare the other is a huge pseudo translation pseudo only because it is to be a huge mine of original as well as ancient and fairy lore by james stevens de la mare is of course known already as the author of poems 
the charm of which is unique in our generation he wrote a novel which was given the polignac prize now discontinued some years ago this was called the return a story of his the three mulla mulgars followed he has long been a reviewer of poetry on the times literary supplement and the westminster gazette a new book of his will be something of an event and if it is as good as i am told it will be very good indeed at least it is bound to be interesting for he could write nothing which had not its own distinction james stevens must already be well known in the united states by his charming novels which are not novels at all but delightful fantasies and studies in the mixture of reality and unreality of life as it appears to those whose imaginations are outside the commonplace run of visualized recollections the new book sounds as though it were a vast affair built upon the solid rock of old fairy and embroidered and enriched by the author's romantic poetic gift it would seem to be less a book than a literature of his own a quarry of jewels and gold and elusive dreams and wild fantasies i await it with a fascination quite securely engendered by the mere report of its qualities and constituents joseph conrad is starting almost at once for corsica in connection with the new napoleonic novel which i spoke of some months ago i do not know whether any of my readers try to imagine what such a book would be but if they have ever read mr conrad with the understanding which i suppose them to do they must immediately have felt what a daring theme it was for one who has made his reputation in other realms to attempt and yet they must have felt with equal certainty that any book which mr conrad might write about the times of the man whom journalists call the eminent corsican would be unlike any other novel having a similar theme in this my intelligent readers would be correct conrad's genius is too individual to allow of a conventional book the napoleonic literature is already overcrowded and he is not the one to add to the congestion but i dare say it will sound strange to hear that this story will if possible leave napoleon out altogether he may force his way in he has a devilish pertinacity but if he can be kept wholly in the background that will be his place in mr conrad's tale the story will deal with the time of napoleon and the reactions of his activities upon that time it will be a romance but a romance of individuals and their environment and for the purpose of having all his own assumptions colored by actual contact with whatever scenes are described mr conrad will go even farther afield than corsica corsica nevertheless is the object of his present journey and the form the journey will take is that of a holiday of saturation you would think from this that mr conrad was fully occupied with napoleonic matters not a bit of it he has too big a mind to ignore the most important things in life therefore he takes a living interest in the greatest subject of all what on earth can that be wonders the reader why food is it so very extraordinary i do not think so he has written a preface and a very remarkable and good preface to his wife's forthcoming cookery book mrs conrad is a famous cook and she has long desired to extend her knowledge of cooking to others this she had done and the book will appear here this year it will contain the preface but it will also contain advice so sagacious so new so ingenious that the world will hereafter be under a debt of gratitude to the author for happy hours happy homes and happy cooks and those who benefit appreciatively from good cooking go by the book as the advertisements of a certain soap used to say and when it appears go buy the book it will be an investment which can never fail to show a profit a third work to appear and this will be soon with the conrad name upon the title page is a collection bearing some such title as thoughts on life and letters for those who think they know mr conrad the book will be a revelation it will show any number of new facets it will do even more than his curious book of reminiscences did to draw aside the veil from his personality here not marlowe will speak 
but conrad himself and the informality of the book will carry us straight into the heart of things with none of those difficult interpositions inevitable in the novels in which a tale is told by means of observant narrators who talk steadily through days and nights without food or sleep and requiring only every now and then to puff up their cigars into a red glow among new biographies is one by lady gregory dealing with the life of sir hugh lane this should be interesting though i doubt whether it will present a portrait which all will recognize lane was a very astounding man but he was one strangely difficult to understand he began in a small way as an employee in the firm of a well-known art dealer he once bought as a genuine work a painting which was regarded by experts as not genuine so he lost his situation he thereupon set up for himself and the hard times he then endured were indescribable by any person who has not had hard times but the corner was turned and lane's success as a connoisseur was little short of miraculous he only bought those things which he felt that given the money he would like himself to possess it was his sole criterion when he needed money he sold what he prized least of history and all the technical side of the expert's work he knew nothing taste was all his joy when once he was showing his collection of chinese treasures to some who talked learnedly of dynasties he was observed to become distrait it appeared that the learning of the experts was wasted upon him he knew only which of the treasures best pleased him and of course his taste had gone straight to those things which upon every ground of connoisseurship were the best lane's tragic death will give additional popular interest to this biography but the man's whole life was in this one respect a romance what can be told of his private affairs must i imagine be very little for he was not communicative and lady gregory is bound to tread carefully among difficult matters george moore's play the coming of gabrielle is either just published or imminent that it should be what is called professionally a good play is out of the question moore's plays never have in that respect been good they are not shaped and handled with the necessary curtness but that the play is a piece of work to interest all the more lovers goes without saying it is published with an irish imprint which i suppose few readers of the play will understand but the actual printing has been done upon this side of the irish channel it is a pretty book it is worth noting that george moore is definitely an english classic nevertheless i have just been reading with a sort of malicious amusement frank harris's masterly portrait of moore in the new book of pen portraits recently published in america it has not appeared here yet but i cannot doubt that if the author consents a publisher will be found for it feeling against the anti-british note always to be read into harris's work is not strong as far as one can tell and the book is certainly amusing and extraordinarily vivid st john irvine's dramatization of h g wells the wonderful visit is to be produced next month at the st martin's theatre in the cast will be found moyna mcgill the delightful young actress who made such a hit here in john ferguson it has been singular to see the grave explanations by wells that the play is really the work of irvine the truth is apparently that the script was read through to wells who made suggestions and comments i suppose that this play will presently appear in the states because it is in america that irvine's principal theatrical successes have been scored this is not at all to minimize his work for the abbey theatre in dublin and elsewhere he is one of the few men who have both written plays and managed theatres or who are capable of doing the two things either separately or simultaneously the production of the wonderful visit brings about the withdrawal of mr galsworthy's successful skin game but we had had a warning of this coming withdrawal because meggie albanese another very talented young actress recently left the cast to take up the principal part in an american comedy called the charm school it is sometimes lamented that there is a dearth of clever actresses but i should imagine that it would be possible to name quite a dozen who could bear severe tests 
first of all i should place a thin sealer who unless i am mistaken will presently be recognized as the best comic actress in these islands but there are others edna best is the best ingenue i have ever seen and if only there were more parts of the gammon variety i imagine that we should hear more of dorothy minto whose work in that genre is unsurpassed unfortunately there is a lack of plays of the right kind which is in no sense to emphasize the limitations of any of these talented actresses this is a problem which deserves attention the other day i was implored by a very charming patron of the drama to produce from my own pocket or the pocket of some other dramatist a play which would give scope for the exercise of a great actor's talents the patron had read either two hundred or two thousand plays it does not matter which for the result would have been the same and in none of these had she been able to find the slightest merit when i see a particularly able piece of acting i always swell with arrogance i say to myself that man or that girl hasn't a chance he or she deserves a play which gives him or her a proper field where is such a play now comes the arrogance i add i will write him or her a play but such generous impulses never come to anything i suppose that this is the case with every author all the same i wonder nobody is led by true appreciation of one of the people i have named or one of those i have not named to attack the problem seriously i should be told that this is not the attitude of the genuine dramatist but i have yet to meet the genuine dramatist why does not somebody go in for my plan i make a present of it to our young would-be dramatists instead of trying to write a play like every other play which has ever been written why not go to life with inspiration from a distinct personality ignore the familiar stars for a time concentrate upon the stars in the east that way lies a possible salvation of the british stage simon pure end of section fourteen section fifteen of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section fifteen lonely by joe felsham i shall walk singing sad music down lonely roads wee moans the night wind and my heart weeps with sadness the great black trees stand in the darkness apart from me and i drift listlessly between them like the night wind straining through the trees wee how my heart is sad End of section 15. Section 16 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section sixteen a literary portrait gallery by annie nathan meyer over the distinguished collection of war portraits which has just been exhibited at the metropolitan museum of art new york and which now starts on its country-wide tour hangs this simple statement exhibition of war portraits by eminent american artists for presentation to the national portrait gallery at washington this will become a part of the national gallery at washington begun in eighteen forty and since eighteen sixty two a part of the smithsonian institute thus says the catalogue initiating and establishing at washington the national portrait gallery a dozen years ago a legacy of paintings was left to the national gallery by a former mistress of the white house a niece of president buchanan and at the time general surprise was expressed that such a gallery existed 
since then the freer evans and johnson gifts have rendered the collection one to be proud of and at last we have started on the way to possess a great national portrait gallery where the portraits of great americans or those who had played an important part in our history would be preserved of course we can never hope to vie with the fascinations of the national british portrait gallery in london and it is hopeless to expect our museums to give up their cherished possessions but it is possible that replicas may in certain cases serve partly to fill the gap even at this late day there are valuable portraits in private possession and in studios that can be secured let us glance over the field with reference solely to literary personages a painting of cotton mather exists somewhere in the country by p pelham and one of jonathan edwards at yale is attributed to smibert the memorial statue of edwards by herbert adams is at northampton massachusetts chester harding painted dr ellery channing whose statue by herbert adams is in boston and charles loring elliott painted fenimore cooper two delightful washington irvings are jarvis's portrait at the age of twenty-seven the hair rather wild as if the wind were blowing through it and vanderlyn's crayon sketch of the group of new england poets bryant was the most fortunate there is the elliott portrait at the corcoran gallery washington and the great portrait of him beardless and fairly young by s f b morse is owned by the academy of design new york there is the bust by herbert adams in bryant park new york and a most interesting undramatized portrait in oils by matthews is at the grolier club new york then there is the lovely head by wyatt eaton who was sent by the century magazine to paint new england's great sextet of oliver wendell holmes eaton wrote his bright face and his clear gray-blue eyes shining with tenderness were irresistible filling me with delight in a week packed with talking while the artist painted dr holmes never once repeated a story or a remark another portrait of dr holmes by j w alexander is owned by harvard university there is a delightful longfellow painted by c g thompson in eighteen forty a pastel by f alexander in eighteen fifty two a beautiful crayon done in eighteen fifty four by samuel lawrence an english painter who also did lowell a painting by badger while longfellow was professor at bowdoin college and the much reproduced portrait by ernest longfellow now in the possession of bowdoin college at the national gallery at washington evans collection there is the longfellow by w e marshall healy painted a portrait of longfellow in eighteen sixty two he also did a delightful hawthorne at the age of forty and another was done by emmanuel lutz a very lovely portrait of hawthorne hangs at the grolier club done by the same c g thompson who painted longfellow and bryant this thompson it is said by his biographer became very intimate with hawthorne in rome and was complimented in the marble fawn n p willis painted by harding is owned by the brook a new york club another portrait of willis by a pupil of sully hangs at the new york historical society where is also palmer's bust of irving ralph goddard a pennsylvania sculptor has at the metropolitan museum of art medallions of hawthorne and longfellow the public library at bradford pennsylvania has a bust of james russell lowell by william ordway partridge and a black and white in oils by francis lathrop hangs at the grolier club w page has given us an interesting portrait of lowell at twenty four at the metropolitan museum of art is a bronze medallion of edgar allan poe by edith woodman burroughs i do not know where are the busts by partridge and by zolnay or the delightful inman painted when poe was nineteen s s osgood painted him twice one portrait is at the authors club new york the other at the new york historical society which owns osgood's alice carey there is a full-length painting of margaret fuller somewhere by william hicks and of ralph waldo emerson 
there is the fine unfinished portrait by william henry furness at the pennsylvania academy a lovely drawing of emerson was done by rouse in eighteen fifty seven and owned by charles eliot norton the only painting of thoreau is owned in new york by george hellman rouse's crayon is at the concord public library where are elwell's bust of louisa alcott and french's bust of emerson of this emerson whimsically declared the more it resembles me the worse it looks but when completed the sage gave his unqualified approval thus that is the face i shave of whittier there exists a charming portrait painted by otis a pupil of gilbert stuart a bust by partridge and at the chicago art institute wyatt eaton's portrait a fine fitzgreen halleck by morse is at the public library new york joseph de camp's portrait of dr horace h furness is at the pennsylvania academy the century club owns an important canvas r h stoddard painted by that distinguished artist j alden weir it also owns a park godwin by frank fowler not so happy as the one temporarily to be seen there by j w alexander alexander also made a drawing of the historian bancroft prescott was painted by ames and also in england in eighteen fifty by george richmond probably the best portrait painted by frank fowler is his william dean howells at the grillier club howells has also been painted by orlando rouland and a charming medallion exists of him and his daughter at the hand of st gaudin henry james has been fortunate in being sketched by sargent by cecilia beau and by his nephew william james a delightful picture in the collection at fenway court boston julia ward howe has been painted by her son-in-law john eliot a bust by clevenger is at the boston public library and a relief by dallin at the boston museum keyser's bust of lanier is at johns hopkins university walt whitman is the subject of two great paintings by two great painters the one by thomas aikens now owned by the pennsylvania academy red-cheeked virile life immense in passion pulse and power the other by j w alexander owned by the metropolitan museum of art ineffable grace of dying days partridge has modelled a bust of whitman his dr s weir mitchell is at the college of physicians in philadelphia where is also a great portrait of our second doctor author by r w vano it is a replica of an earlier one owned by the pennsylvania academy which also owns vano's charles francis adams dr mitchell is in a blue coat a scarlet cravat and pearl gray trousers against a gray background the thoughtful distinguished face and the long sensitive hands are beautifully done mark twain has been portrayed many times and in many forms favorites of mine are the characteristic portrait corncob pipe in mouth by carol beckwith owned by twain's daughter mrs gabrillowich and a delightful drawing by abbott thayer owned by the chicago institute of art which also has his drawing of george cable a most successful portrait bust of john bigelow was done by edith woodman burroughs and a portrait in oils by rouland the john heron institute of art at indianapolis owns a characteristic sergeant the portrait of james whitcomb riley a full-length portrait of another hoosier author edward eggleston is still in the studio of irving wiles where it should not be suffered to remain long here is an important portrait by an important artist which should at once be secured for the new portrait gallery another portrait which is available is the william winter painted by rouland the critic being seated in one of his treasures the armchair of horace greeley there is another winter somewhere by frank d millet daniel huntington painted george william curtis and edward everett hale's bust by partridge is at the union league club chicago one of the fine portraits that may be free some day to go to the national portrait gallery is the richard watson gilder by cecilia beau who has also made drawings of thomas janvier owned by the century club henry james and s weir mitchell anything however slight from the hand of miss beau 
is to be cherished another drawing by the way of the picturesque head of thomas janvier was done by carol beckwith who also painted percival lowell john kendrick bangs and an unfinished oliver herford the detroit art gallery owns a splendid full-length portrait of ike marvel by gary melchers known as the fencing master although henry george is not strictly a literary man i must include his portrait at the metropolitan museum because it was painted by that most distinguished painter who has not given us near enough portraits george de forest brush of our playwrights with the exception of a charming pen and ink sketch of bronson howard at the authors club i know only the portrait of clyde fitch by chase at amherst and a bust of augustus thomas by robert aitken of living men and women there are portraits of edwin arlington robinson by leela cabot perry of robert underwood johnson by chase one of his very best an arresting vigorous sketch of booth tarkington done in oils at a single sitting by j w alexander owned by the quadrangle club at princeton a henry van dyke by the same artist a bronze bust of george woodbury by partridge now at the cheshire academy connecticut as well as a bust by the same sculptor by edwin markham who has also been done by roulon but it seems to me never so satisfactorily as his splendid head would warrant hamlin garland is another distinguished-looking man who has never had quite his due in paint although he has been done by louis betts and by roulon the betts portrait is owned by the academy of arts and letters betts has also painted an emerson huff now in chicago the property of the author the indefatigable orlando roulon has painted john burroughs seventeen times one portrait done in his doctor's robes hangs at yale university one done at the request of theodore roosevelt was owned by him would that more like roulon found poets and philosophers as paintable as bankers there also exists by him a portrait of irving batcheller and one of james lane allen owned by the public library at lexington kentucky there is a crayon portrait of kate douglas wiggin by charles akers a medallion by st godin of mrs schuyler van rensselaer and a delightful edith wharton by julian story i include dr richard cabot who has written on social questions because of his portrait by that fine sincere artist john johansen a bust exists of our dean of critics william c brownell by olin warner laredo taft in his history of american sculpture says of it it is among the choicest of our native productions in this field leo milesiner has done a portrait in oils of w p trent and drawn ellis parker butler arthur guiderman frank jewett mather in red chalk within the bounds of the exceedingly limited time given me to write this article it has been absolutely impossible to attempt an exhaustive account but it is hoped that my efforts will inspire others to complete the list an interesting plan has been formulated by the national art committee whereby the cities of the nation may have a share in creating the national portrait gallery the portraits may be financed by an art patron of a city and presented in the name of that city a representative of that city at the same time becoming an honorary member of the national art committee i suggest that not alone cities but smaller communities from one end of the united states to the other should set about without delay to contribute portraits of those citizens of whom they are most proud it is well too not to wait too long for some of the most delightful portraits of the past are those of the young who then stood on the threshold of fame end of section sixteen section seventeen of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various 
Section 17 30,000 Poets from Japan by Shigeyoshi Obata. One of the many ceremonials that fill the Mikado's court calendar for the month of January is the first meeting of the year for poetry recitation, known as Utagokwai Hajime. The word for Uta is another name for the Tanka, the native and orthodox diminutive poem of 31 syllables in five divisions. The second phrase means august meeting, and the third commencement. This time-honored institution, established in 1484, was for several centuries exclusively a court function. A theme was assigned by the emperor himself, and it was only members of the imperial family and high-born personages of the palace who gathered to recite their New Year's poems. Early in the reign of the late emperor Meiji, however, certain officials of high rank were invited to attend. Then the people at large began to participate by sending in poems for their sovereign's perusal. In 1879, the institution was further popularized by having several poems selected from the work of the people read together with those of the imperial courtiers. It is a quaint and impressive ceremony. At 10 o'clock in the morning, the officials of the Poetry Bureau of the court arrive to see that all is in readiness in the hall of the phoenix birds. Robed in sumptuous brocades, the imperial prince and the princesses enter, followed by the ministers and all other men of preeminence who are privileged to attend. Then a steward requests the presence of their majesties, the emperor and empress, who presently appear in the hall, accompanied by the minister of the palace, the lord chamberlain, and various attendants. All rise and make deep obeisance. After their majesties are seated, the staff of the court poets advance, taking a place of honor for the performance of their special duties of the day. The master reader places the poems in a tray before his majesty and announces, The poems composed by the imperial command at the beginning of the year on the theme of so-and-so. Then he gives the first reading, slowly speaking the poem, and the name and rank of its author. Again, the master prompter reads the first division of the poem, and the chorus of clear-voiced master reciters join him, finishing the last four divisions in unison. Thus each poem is read and recited, beginning with that of the author whose station in life is lowliest. When they reach the verses of the members of the imperial household, the recitation is repeated twice. When these are finished, the master poet makes a move to leave his post, as if his task were ended. Shibaraku, a moment, master. The master reader halts him, for there are still the poems of the emperor and empress to be recited. Has the master poet forgotten? No, this is simply an elaborate piece of etiquette, signifying the reverential hesitancy on his part to allow the poems of his sovereigns to be read in a continuous sequence with those of the subjects, the ceremony proceeds. The master reader receives the poem of the empress. It is recited three times. Finally, he approaches his majesty, the emperor, with great trepidation. He takes the imperial poem haltingly. Then it is rehearsed by the master poet, prompted and recited as before five times, while the whole assembly, including the empress, rises to listen reverently. The ceremony is over. At noon there is a palace banquet where gifts are presented to those poets who took part in the recitation. That evening in Tokyo and the next morning all over the empire, newspapers print the poems, including those selected from the people, stories about the happy winners of the honor, interviews by ubiquitous reporters. Although no prizes are involved in this affair, it long ago developed into a poetry contest of national scope, in which thousands compete for the honor of having their poems recited before that exalted audience, as well as for the unutterable satisfaction of seeing their poems printed in all the newspapers and statistical almanacs of Japan. The number of participants increases astonishingly. In the 80s, it was several thousand. It passed the 15,000 mark early in the first decade of the present century, and in recent years it has been rapidly approaching the 30,000 goal. 
ordinarily the poems are descriptive sketches of the same subjects and scenes viewed from a thousand different angles sometimes the author pays compliments to the emperor by referring to the peace and prosperity of his reign here is a typical group i choose a few from the commencement poems of nineteen twenty on the theme the early plum flower of countryside though in winter with your hedge grass growing green your plum trees are in flower o house of little garden the emperor ah a house i see where e'er the time the plum trees are in flower yonder across the small unplowed field the empress without awaiting the spring you begin to bloom a field by the hedge of a lowly cottage o first plum flower of the year an imperial princess let me come and winter here among your plum tree rows a bloom ere the springtime o hamlet of the hills an imperial princess with the year's harvest of abundance with the fragrance of plum flower before the winter has passed o blessed hamlet of the hills the minister of the palace you mimic the hue of the hoar-frost but hide not your fragrance o plum trees by the door of a cottage on the hill the master poet even in winter bloom the plum trees under your majesty's reign while over villages of wide acres the smoke rises in abundance the steward even in america the japanese preserve their beautiful custom the new year's day issues of the vernacular papers published in california contain many a column of tanka and other kinds of verse the poetic propensity of the race has survived the toils and trials in a strange land in fact it seems contagious for a dispatch from tokyo states that an american woman mrs charles burnett wife of a united states legation attache who has learned to write in japanese has won the coveted honor at this year's recitation the theme was the dawn at the shinto shrine in the section seventeen section eighteen of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 18. Walt Whitman, Drama Critic, by Alexander Wolcott. Probably most of us never knew, or having known, forgot that walt whitman was once cabined and confined as the entirely respectable editor of the brooklyn eagle although it is easy to believe that the successive generations of bright young men who have alone tarried a while in the office of that journal have liked to keep the fact in mind as some sort of assurance that they too might be serving a mere apprenticeship in letters and would doubtless go forth each and every one to write a leaves of grass wherewith to jounce the universe it had you see been done two of his successors cleveland rogers and john black the latter a young poet and the former one of the ablest soundest and most persuasive of present-day american newspaper men have been making the dust fly where once the fur flew have that is been busily digging into the files of the eagle from march eighteen forty six to january eighteen forty eight the span of nearly two years during which whitman held and enjoyed what he later described as one of the pleasantest sits of his life the resultant mass of political broadsides essays and criticisms either literary domestic or musical they have now collected in two volumes which derive their title from the good gray poet's own phrase about the big strong days our young days days of preparation the gathering of the forces it is difficult to stifle a regret that they did not less pretentiously entitle their findings the forgotten works of 
walter whitman among their many hypothetical explanations of why all this available material had been neglected by whitman's publishers and biographers they do not suggest either of two that must occur immediately to any reader of their collection that the stuff was hardly worth the labor involved in its exhumation or more positively that its republication would be a distinct disservice to the reputation of a great name such republications are almost invariably of this effect as you may verify by reading the dreary stuff by kipling and barry which to their own intense annoyance a later fame dragged forth from decent interment in old newspaper files yet if the gathering of the forces adds not a cubit to whitman's stature it does provide mildly interesting new material for his future biographers and while you may be quite unconscious of any hope that there will be another whitman biography you must at least expect one and indeed after the amazing tour de force achieved by mr strachey and his eminent victorians and meditated by him in his threatened life of the prince consort there can be no saying when and of whom a brilliant biography will not dislodge all others from the shelf of course these assembled press clippings not only light up for a time in the face of one whom a surviving printer's devil still recalls as a nice kind man but constitute an even more valuable source-book for such alluring adventures in reconstruction as the age of innocence say or richard carvel indeed they provide in convenient and comparatively portable form a little of that endless pleasure many of us find in access to the yellowing files of magazines and newspapers it takes a genius to create anything more entertaining than a volume of the new york evening post of any day save our own to mull idly over the editorials and news items and advertisements of the new york that exhausted dickens of the new york that embittered rachel and of the new york that elected lincoln is to indulge in a diverting and ever illuminating pastime something of that entertainment is provided in the gathering of the forces and makes handsome amends for the discovery that in the midst of writing much that was wholesome and brave and characteristic and prophetic walter whitman was the kind of journalist who gave way at times to such internecine strife as etansville knew that he bore an occasional disturbing resemblance to the jefferson brick who welcomed martin chuzzlewit and that he was the kind of paragrapher who would burst forth without warning in the wise Quote, carelessly knocking a man's eye out with a broken axe may be termed a bad axe-a-dent such archaeological research always rewards you with a dual sense of mankind as both changeless and changing so that in the midst of paragraphs musty with their illusion of a bygone day you come stumbling on evidences that whitman wrote but yesterday such evidences for instance as his pronunciamento that mexico must be chastised his suggestion that servants are not hard to keep if you but treat them with dignity his discovery that the drama is in a state of decline and his disposition to blame its decay on the star system for whitman was a dramatic critic taking up such work at about the time poe dropped it and though it is tempting to let you savor his anti-slavery propaganda and his emotions on a trip to coney island in the stage-coach days you will get an even better sense of him if you sample his reviews and find even happier indices of how times have changed and of how they haven't for instance if you would change the fraction from five-sixths to one-third the following indictment would be no great exaggeration of dramatic criticism as it is written in new york to-day of the method in which five-sixths of the theatrical criticism of the new york press comes into existence 
may be mentioned the long cut and dried puff in yesterday's new york herald of the keens acting in a play which accidentally didn't come off this is not the first nor the second nor the third awkward blunder of the kind which has occurred of late most of the criticisms in the metropolitan press are written before the plays are played and paid for by the theatre or other parties of those which are not so paid for the majority are the fruits of solicitation favoritism and so on in the midst of all that stale and unwholesome utterance the speaking of a single paragraph of unbiased truth falls like an alarming and terrible thing it would be a curious result and a profitable one to take the while to the theatre some man highly educated and knowing the world and other things but totally fresh to the stage and let him give his real opinions of the queer sort of doings he would see there Unquote. and this written as it was a year after the production of mrs mowat's fashion at the park is significant and interesting Quote, the drama of this country can be the mouthpiece of freedom refinement liberal philanthropy beautiful love for all our brethren polished manners and elevated good taste it could wield potent away to destroy any attempt at despotism it can attack and hold up to scorn bigotry fashionable affectation avarice and all unmanly follies youth may be warned by its fictitious portraits of the evil of unbridled passions in order to reap such by no means difficult results the whole method of theatricals as at present pursued in new york needs first to be overthrown new york city is the only spot in america where such a revolution could be attempted too with all our servility to foreign fashions there is at the heart of the intelligent masses there a lurking propensity toward what is original and has a stamped american character of its own in new york also are gathered a number of men literary persons and others who have a strong desire to favor anything which shall extricate us from the entangled and by no means creditable position we already hold of playing second fiddle to europe these persons most of them young men enthusiastic democratic and liberal in their feelings are daily acquiring a greater and greater power and after all anything appealing to the honest heart of the people as to the peculiar and favored children of freedom as to a new race and with a character separate from the kingdoms of other countries would meet with a ready response and strike at once the sympathies of all the true men who love america their native or chosen land Unquote. the above sentiments guided somewhat this critic of the forties in his passionate devotion to our own charlotte cushman whom he usually referred to simply as c c and whom he defiantly described as the greatest performer in any hemisphere they doubtless discolored too his vision of the keens and particularly of mrs keen she who had been ellen tree when these gracious visitors to the new world were too much lauded by whitman's fellow first-nighters listen to his fierce review of mrs keen Quote, of the lady truth will not allow much more favorable mention she was a young woman of genius she is merely the frame and fuse of that time with none of its pliant grace its smoothness its voluptuous swell merely x tree and not extra gallantry and common politeness require the avoidance of criticizing her merits as plainly as her husband's manliness and ordinary decency however demand even more imperatively the avoidance of that fulsome soldering of praise which a portion of the papers voluntarily demean themselves to publish Unquote. for all we know of the theatre whitman denounced it must really have been pretty bad particularly in the dire poverty of its literature but his vehement announcements of its 
decline fall on ears a little deafened from the same song sung in england at a time when fielding was managing one theatre sheridan writing for another and kemble garrick and mrs siddons lending dignity to the entertainments of the hour in the eighties they were looking back wistfully to the very era that so dissatisfied whitman and now those same regrettable eighties are being held up to us in shining contrast to the melancholy condition of our own stage during the early days of the war by adding together the french advances as daily reported in the bennett newspapers it used to be facetiously calculated that the germans were making one last desperate stand near vladivostok and a temperature chart of the decline of the stage as reported in each generation since shakespeare would reveal it as now out of sound or hearing in the depths of the bottomless pit the gathering of the forces by walt whitman edited by cleveland rogers and john black two volumes g p putnam's sons end of section eighteen Section 19 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 19. Old Love and New Poetry, or Vice Versa by floyd dell there is a very challenging prefatory note to this new book of poems by mr untermeyer it is called a note on the poetry of love and its thesis is that the poets of the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries did not know how to write about love they wrote about it a great deal to be sure they wrote about hardly anything else but they were clumsy and ignorant in their treatment of love to make his indictment as inclusive as possible, Mr. Untermeyer specifically names three poets who represent almost the whole range of the love poetry of these two centuries, Pope, Tennyson, and Swinburne. And he says, none of these poets knew, or to be more accurate, knew now to express what love between the sexes really meant. Not very many years ago, an attack of this kind upon the major deities of English poetry would have been punished by those whose function it is to guard the sacred precincts of literature from impious marauders. Mr. Untermeyer would have been excommunicated from all God-fearing literary circles. But the times, it seems, have changed. There was no one left, except Harry Kemp, to do reverence to the memory of Pope. A young poet can say what he likes about Tennyson with impunity. And even Swinburne, Swinburne of the perpetual raptures and roses, is relegated into the company of Edward Bach, late of the Ladies' Home Journal, as one who knew nothing about women. Far be it from me to rise in their defense. It was so sober a critic as Matthew Arnold, I believe, who said that the trouble with the poets of his century was that they did not know enough. And since it was love that they almost exclusively wrote about, he may very well have been anticipating Mr. Untermeyer's opinion that they did not know enough about women. I think myself this is profoundly true, but I would not have ventured to say so in print if Mr. Untermeyer had not already done so, and proved that one could do it and yet live. But I have, even if Mr. Untermeyer has not, a sentiment of reverence, and I would not subscribe to these disrespectful opinions about the great ones without the excuse of a violent personal emotion on the subject. If Shelley had sold you some bad mining stock, you would feel at liberty to criticize his economic views. Well, that is the way I feel about the poets. They have deceived and misled me, betrayed my youthful confidence and trust. In short, cheated me. They pretended to know something about love. And now I know that all their expert lore was bogus, and I am angry at them. Moreover, I suspect that the whole of the younger generation must feel somewhat the same way about them. Or Mr. Untermeyer's preface would not have been received with such calmness. 
But above all, I suspect that this same personal grudge, rather than any coldly critical process, is the origin of Mr. Untermeyer's own present views. My suspicion is confirmed by a glance at Mr. Untermeyer's earliest book of poems, now ten years old. First Love, it is called. As a book of poems, it is pretty bad. But I have no intention of bringing up his youthful technical blunders against him now. It is as a record of sentimental attitudes that the volume interests me. I quote only one stanza with apologies to everyone concerned. It hurts me just as much as it does them. My soul is sick of roses, of lilies proud and pale. In scented garden closes, the old-time beauties fall. And though the spell reposes on every flower that grows, my soul is sick of roses, and she has scorned the rose. It may seem unjust to blame Pope and Tennyson and Swinburne for a stanza like that. But what else can you blame? Not New York City, in which Mr. Untermeyer was born and reared, nor the subway, nor the Hearst papers, nor any other unfortunate environmental influences to which this young poet was subjected. Certainly not the young woman, whoever she was, who inspired this lyric outburst. I do not mean to suggest that Mr. Untermeyer was peculiarly susceptible to such influences, nor alone in reproducing them. We are all doing it. How else could a young man learn about love except by reading the poets? How else, indeed, except by opening his eyes and looking at the girl he was interested in, and seeing what she was like, and saying what he felt about the real she, who was, one may safely surmise, utterly unlike the Chloe's and Maud's and Faustine's of English poesy. Who was, one may safely surmise, utterly unlike the Chloe's and Maud's and Faustine's of English poesy. Well, Mr. Untermeyer has been opening his eyes of late, and has been saying what he thinks of the female of the species. Sometimes it is an angry protest against her spiritual demands. Sometimes a tribute of childlike gratitude to her bodily sweetness. Sometimes a piece of ironic mockery at their failure to make two selfish wishes meet in one perfection. Or again, it is such a momentary amused wonder as this, before the prim old mirror that stands so stiffly there, with Puritan precision you rearrange your hair, my pretty proper darling with not one hair amiss, who turns like some calm duty one powdered cheek to kiss. Are you the same wild creature I held last night and found sleeping upon my shoulder with all her hair unbound? But always it is a real emotion that is dealt with, always a reflection of experience that can recognizably be found, if not in the pages of Palgrave's Golden Treasury, at least in the life of any mortal lover. And it is so much more interesting. No wonder Mr. Untermeyer is angry at Pope and Tennyson and Swinburne, who for a time by their strange and ethereal and traditional notions succeeded in blurring for him the outlines of this ever-interesting reality. The New Adam by Lewis Untermeyer, Harcourt Brace and Company. End of section 19. Recording by Chris Pyle. Section 20 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various section twenty the baltimore antichrist by f scott fitzgerald the incomparable mencken will i fear meet the fate of aristides he will be exiled because one is tired of hearing his praises sung in at least three contemporary novels he is mentioned as though he were dead as voltaire and as secure as shaw with what he would term a polite bow his style is imitated by four-fifths of the younger critics moreover he has demolished his enemies and set up his own gods in the literary supplements of the essays in the new book the best is the autopsy on the still damp bones of roosevelt in the hands of mencken roosevelt becomes almost a figure of greek tragedy more he becomes alive 
and loses some of that stuffiness that of late has become attached to all one hundred per cent americans not only is the essay most illuminating but its style is a return to mencken's best manner the style of prefaces with a soft pedal on his amazing chord of adjective and a tendency to invent new similes instead of refurbishing his amazing but somewhat overworked old ones except for the section on american aristocracy there is little new in the first essay the national letters an abundance of wit and a dozen ideas that within the past year and under his own deft hand have become bromides the knights of pythias right thinkers on building universities methodists as well as the corps of journeyman critics and popular novelists come in for their usual bumping this varied with unexpected tolerance toward the saturday evening post and even a half grudging mention of booth tartington better than any of this comment valid and vastly entertaining as it is would be a second book of prefaces say on edith wharton cabell woodrow wilson and mencken himself but the section of the essay devoted to the cultural background rises to brilliant analysis here again he is thinking slowly he is on comparatively fresh ground he brings the force of his clarity and invention to bear on the subject passes beyond his function as a critic of the arts and becomes a reversed cato of a civilization in the sahara of Bozart, the dam breaks devastating georgia carolina mississippi and company the first trickle of this overflow appeared in the preface to the american credo here it reaches such a state of invective that one pictures all the region south of mason dixon to be peopled by moron catalans the ending is gentle too gentle the gentleness of ennui to continue in the grand manner of a catalogue the divine afflatus deals with the question of inspiration and the lack of it an old and sad problem to the man who has done creative work examination of a popular virtue runs to eight pages of whimsical excellence a consideration of ingratitude decided at length with absurd but mellow justice exeunt omnis which concerns the menace of death i choose to compare with a previous discussion of the same subject in a book of burlesques the comparison is only in that the former piece which i am told mencken fatuously considers one of his best is a hacked out blued together bit of foolery as good say as an early essay of mark twain's while this excellent omnis which follows it by several years is smooth brilliant apparently jointless to my best recollection it is the most microscopical examination of this particular mote on the sun that i have ever come across follows a four-paragraph exposition of the platitude that made much music loving is an affectation in further paragraphs depreciating opera as a form as to the music of to-morrow the present reviewer's ignorance must keep him silent but in tempo de valse mencken the modern becomes victorian by insisting that what people are tired of is more exciting than what they have just learned to do if his idea of modern dancing is derived from watching men who learned it circa thirty five toiling interminably around the jostled four feet of a cabaret he is justified but i see no reason why the bouncing shimmy efficiently performed is not as amusing and as graceful and certainly as difficult as any waltz ever attempted the section continues with the condemnation of a musician named hadley an ingenious attempt to preserve a portrait of dreiser and a satisfactory devastation of the acting profession in the cult of hope he defends his and dr nathan's attitude toward constructive criticism most entertainingly but the next section the dry millennium 
patchworked from the repetition generale consists of general repetitions of theses in his previous books and an appendix on a tender theme contains his more recent speculations on women eked out with passages from the smart set an excellent book like max beerbohm mencken's work is inevitably distinguished but now and then one wonders granted that solidly book by book he has built up a literary reputation most to be envied of any american granted also that he has done more for the national letters than any man alive one is yet inclined to regret a success so complete what will he do now the very writers to the press about the blue sabbath hurl the bricks of the buildings he has demolished into the still smoking ruins he is say forty how of the next twenty years will he find new gods to dethrone some eternal yokelry still callous enough to pose as intelligentia before the minkian pen fingers or will he strut among the ruins a man beaten by his own success as futile in the end as one of those conrad characters that so tremendously enthrall him review of prejudices second series by h l mencken alfred a knopf end of section twenty